our our teacher, our presenter, our extraordinaire. I wanted to go over a few housekeeping things um, in case anybody's new to Zoom. I, I, I'm not thinking you are. Um, <laughs> first of all, we will be um, staying on mute. She's going to present her talk. She's going to reserve questions to the end and then we'll get through those questions. I will imp impose a break about an hour or so into it because sitting in one spot is hard um, and can get frustrating. And also feel free to turn off your screens if you need to. Um, I get it. I'm becoming more aware of the Zoom world and I was sitting in one spot for long periods of time, staring at our own faces because Let's be honest, nine times out of 10, we're looking at how we look on the screen than other people. <laughs> <laughs> can, be, can be rough. So with all of that said, um, I did not pull up Angela's bio so that I can read it to you. So if you'll give me a moment while I, or no, better yet, Angela will tell you about herself because she's <laughs> awesome that way. Personally, me and Angela have come into contact, and since we have come into contact, we have had robust and beautiful conversations around spiritualism and around uh, the lack of information on people of color's impact and influence in modern American spiritualism. Today, we're focused on African-American spiritualism. However, she has a really great wealth of information in terms of Native Americans um, and other indigenous populations throughout the world, not just in the United States. And she also is generously allowing for this particular program to be donated, all proceeds to be donated to the Bertha Career, um, found, uh, Bertha Career Headstone Fundraiser. Um, for those who might not know who Bertha Career is, Reverend Bertha Career was one of our spiritualist pioneers. She was the first American female American and first black woman to receive both credentials from the SNU, the uh, Spiritualist National Union, and um, ordained in the National Spiritual Association Association at the time of this association came churches later. Um, she was also a medium, a pastor, um, and was a part of the split when the split happened between people of color um, in the spirit in, in, in the NSA religion um, and a myriad of other things. But without further ado though, we're not, thank you Angela for that, for your generous donation. This is being recorded and it will be available um, in the cloud. If any of you guys wanna see it later or want a link, um, there will be a time frame on it. Um, just let me know and I will email you a link to the to this talk um, and then also if you know any friends or family members who wanted to be a participant but were unable to make it if they make a $45 donation to our pay to the church of peace um, paypal we'll be more than happy to send them the link to the cloud presentation so they can watch it later so now i'm gonna shut up because it ain't about me today i'm here to learn and soak it all up. Angela, please share. Oh, I love you. You know that. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Angela Gunshore. A um, little bit about my background. Um, I am a professor of history for American Military University and American Public University. There I teach a variety of different minority subjects, including African American history, the history of Africa. And my background as far as all my academics, um, I have focused both my bachelor's and my master's on minority um, history, mainly African American women and Native American women history. And I also have uh, done massive research in minority military history, especially World War I. So um, I am currently a Morris Pratt Institute student where I am uh, hopefully receiving soon my, my credentials. 
And uh, my goal is to hopefully branch out with spiritualism and history and combine the two and just educate more people on the connection between the two. So I'm just so honored that I can help a worthy cause with Reverend uh, Bertha Creer's um, headstone, but also reach more of an audience and to explain how African spiritualism is impacting or has impacted modern American spiritualism. So um, again, uh, just a, a, be, a brief um, request, write down any questions you have, but let me present the material first, because um, when I was presenting this to Sharon, she would have questions. I'm like, wait a minute, the next slide will answer it. So if you allow me to present all of the information, hopefully any questions that you do come up with will be answered throughout the presentation. But I guarantee this is going to be a wealth of information, and I've done a lot of research. Um, if you're very interested in all of the material that I researched for this presentation, you can actually write Travon or email her, and she will send you, I think it's seven pages of the bibliography. Um, a lot of academic sources as uh, instructor of history, that's all I go for is journals and primary sources and, and to try to prove uh, the information. Okay, so let's get started. Now, can everybody see the slides, the, the, the main page? If you can't, please let us know. All right, so the presentation is The Impact of African Spiritualism on America. The history of African spiritualism in the New World is going to be outlined in this presentation. We're going to start with before 1619. For some reason in American history, we tend to teach students 1619 and after, but there's so much African history before 1619. So I'm going to cover a little bit of that to explain how the religious and spiritualist views of African tribes and, and groups and nations and empires were already in the New World even before Columbus landed. And then we're going to talk about the slave history because 12 million Africans were forced to the New World, but that didn't stop their spirituality and their religious beliefs and their influence on anyone and everyone that were connected to them. Experience, living among, being a part of their lives. And then we're going to talk about modern American spiritualism after 1848 and their connection to African spiritualism. I also want to just kind of guide you to look at some of the images I have picked for this presentation because they all have a history to them. And um, this picture is a paint or this painting is a Rosalind painting and we will talk about the woman that is featured in this painting because I actually have information and she is a spiritualist. All right, so African dynasties in the new world brought medicine, healing, and spiritual beliefs. Most of us are taught in fifth grade, fourth grade, maybe even a little bit later about the Egyptian dynasties, the pharaohs and all that. That is still African history. But what we're rarely taught is the dynasties that were on the West Coast, such as the Mali Empire, the, the Benin Empire, the Congo. Those empires and dynasties were even larger, some of them, than the Roman Empire, richer than even the European empires. And so before 1619, they had a lot of trade and interaction with the world, not just Europe, not just Africa, not those continents, but the world. So we're going to start with Egypt. In 1292 BC, King Ramsay III actually documented how his trade vessels reached a new world. They traded with groups they encountered. They talked about dark-skinned people on a land that they had never seen before. And it won't be until the 1990s that archaeologists will actually find evidence of this in, of all places, the Grand Canyon. This uh, picture behind us is actually a documented papaya uh, report, per se, from King Ramsay III's dynasty that actually tells the story of this voyage. 
and of this trade. So we have documentation of Africans in North America as early as 1292 BC. In 455 BC, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote of the Egyptian pharaoh's great seafaring expeditions and talked about these trading journeys and the type of people they encountered and what they looked like. In 1311 AD, King Abakuri II, a Mali emperor, sent over 400 ships across the great waters to trade materials, crops, astronomy, art, and religious practices with the new people, and to share all of their techniques. Some of these ships stayed up to four to five years. And it is believed they landed as far north as um, Maine and Newfoundland, and as far south as South America. So all of this was given to these people that they discovered, including religious practices. After 1492, Christopher Columbus documented how the indigenous people of the Caribbean, mainly the island we now call Haiti, had stories of visitors that looked like the knight who visited their islands, traded with them and left goods. And actually one tribe showed Christopher Columbus a gold tipped lance spear that had the markings of a West African Guinea people. And what he discovered is that their techniques of tile making and religious practices actually resembled some of the African cultures that the Portuguese and the Spanish had traded with and had known about. But I think one of the histories that I get so passionate about is how the Spanish settled South Carolina, Virginia area before the English even started their exploration of the New World. In 1526, an explorer for the Spanish um, Empire literally settled in what we now call Jamestown, Virginia. And he started a whole colony there called San Miguel. And after a very harsh winter, and nobody really knows what happened, he decided to pack up things and leave because he felt the land was too hard. But when he left, he actually left 100 African slaves behind. Now, some theories and legends say that those African slaves intermarried with the, the Lumbee and the Cherokee and other groups in that area. Some people say they are the direct descendants of the Melegian group of West Virginia and Virginia and Kentucky. We're not sure what happened to those Africans, but it is documented by the Spanish that they were literally left behind. Now, slavery was still so new by 1526. So most of those Africans would have retained their African roots, culture, and customs, including spirituality. But let's compare African spirituality to the indigenous North American spirituality. These are Akan drums. Akan is a tribe that's now known maybe in Ghana and regions in that area of Africa. The belief is that if you drum, the noise and vibration will raise your vibration and you will be able to connect with a higher being. This, is a drum that's used by most indigenous groups of powwows. Um, it's very similar in make, but its stories have said that the drum was a gift of the creator. And some stories, especially of the Cherokee and Seminole nations, talk about how the drum was also a gift by the dark people. These are a con face masks used in ritual spiritualist ceremonies. These are the Hanoshi or ha Iroquois face masks. Um, they're used in their spiritual ceremonies. Now, again, these are comparisons. Do we know for a fact that the, in, the Iroquois Confederation or the people that practice face masks, uh, religious spiritual things will say that they were given to them by uh, African spiritualists? Probably not, because it was so long ago. I mean, 1300s, right? But there is a comparison. We need to acknowledge that over 12 million 
Africans left the shores of Africa in a forced kidnapping during the Atlantic slave trade. Now, regardless if only 500,000 were given in North America, they were also sent to Central, South, and the Caribbean. So Central America got around 3 million and South America, especially Brazil, got over 4 million. And the Caribbean also had very large groups moving through their islands. 12 million people from various nations, empires, tribes, and cultures came to the new world. There has to be an impact. I mean, think for yourself, you meet one person, they influence your life, but you get 12 million of a group coming into the land and inspiring and influencing. There has to be an impact. This is a map of the actual groupings and where they came from in Africa and where they more or less were sent. Now, the largest group is going to come from the Congo, 5 million. They're gonna mainly be sent to Brazil and Central America and places such as Jamaica and Haiti. The group I'm gonna focus on for my lecture is, or my Lyceum is this group out of the Gold Coast with 1.2 million. And they mainly are coming from the Benin, Ghana um, area. And they're going to be part, and I'm going to focus mainly on the Akan people, but this group is going to be the ones that are going to settle in North America mainly. So the Gold Coast, the Akan people, and their Oba Yaifo, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's because OB is spelled, that's a different thing, and we'll talk about that in a minute but they will influence and spread spiritualism to the new world. Their belief in the supreme or inventor, they call them. The Aja speaking and the Yoruba culture will influence Santo Domingo. We'll see a lot of movement in Santo Domingo and obviously later on ma major revolutions and rebellion. The Kwa language group was a mix of Akan and Aja speaking people and they will merge cultural aspects of African spiritualism in North America specifically. My argument or my case or my thesis is that without the influence of African spiritualism on European colonies across the New World, modern spiritualism, what we know today, could have not emerged the way it did. There is a definite connection between African spiritualism, their influence on colonies, and what today we call modern spiritualism. Okay, so I want to show you a little bit about Africa. For some reason in America, we tend to view Africa as a big nation, and that's wrong. Africa before European colonization was made up of various different nations, tribes, and cultures. Each had their own language, their own religion, their own customs. They all had physical differences. The only thing really combining or you know, connecting them was that they were of dark skin but variations of dark skin. As Europe colonized, starting with the Portuguese, they've refused to view the African individually. Instead, they just grouped anybody of dark skin as an African. And I argue still today in 2021, we still do that. We deny a person, say from Ghana or Kenya or Ethiopia, the right to have their own individuality. We don't do that to Europeans. We know the difference between a German and a British and an Italian and a French. We know the difference. We, are, we actually teach American students the difference between an Italian and a German. But we don't do that when we teach about African history or African-American history. We need to remember that Africa was a continent made up of multiple nations, empires, dynasties, cultures, tribes, customs, languages. The area we're going to study for this lecture is literally this area right in here. And the Akan people, which is today modern day Ivory Coast, Ghana and Benin, is the area where a lot of the human trafficking occurred. So I just wanna just highlight the difference here and make that point that we need to see the Akan people for their individual culture as we continue with this lecture. 
Now, spiritualism. I want to remind us all what our principles are because I'm going to compare them to a con spirituality. And you're going to hopefully see the similarities. In spiritualism, we believe in God. We call him an infinite intelligence. We believe that God is expressed through all nature. So we connect nature to the creator. We believe true religion is living in obedience to natural laws. We believe in balance. We believe that we never die. We just transcend, transition. We believe that spiritualism proves that we can talk with people in the spirit world. We have a connection even beyond this physical form. We also advise that we should be kind, do good, and others will hopefully do likewise. We also look at our happiness and our unhappiness, and we figure out a way to live to bring more happiness in our lives. And usually that involves following the law of life, the natural laws. We believe in reformation or every day is a new beginning. We can start anew, even beyond death, right? And we really believe in the prophecy and healings are the expression of the infinite intelligence. So this is what modern day spiritualism focuses on. A con spirituality at the time of the transatlantic slave trade, they believed in an infinite inventor. This supreme entity created the universe and all in it. They believe that this creator was omnipotent and connected to earth and nature. They were together. They believed in spirit guides assisting humans on earth. They believed in natural laws and the state that rules humankind. They believed having balance. They believed in ancestral communication. That meant those who passed on too were available to all who were interested in talking to their ancestors. They believed in a living spirit medium who can interpret the words of spirit and remove Ill illnesses. So a healer and a medium. They also believed in prophecy and receiving energy from the creator. They also believed in spiritual purification or reformation. They actually had an annual cleansing ceremony, an annual healing ceremony. They cleansed the house, the environment, the person, the people, the, the groups. If we look at a con spirituality and we look at spiritualism, there's a lot of similarities there. Zahan noted that in African religious universe, the supreme being was central. As the enslaved African was stolen from their homes, their families, and literally their sense of freedom and sold to European American slavery, the supreme being was virtually the only being that they could truly rely upon. In the Americas, they would find a religion fundamentally, op fundamentally opposite of what they knew. And yet, as the enslaved African arrived on the Atlantic coast of the New World, it would be their spiritual identification which would forge common bonds, become a beacon of hope in the most desperate and dismal of times, and above all, would set, set the foundation of the quest for liberation through rebellion, uprising, insurrection, African spirituality in America. So everything was taken from them in slavery. They had their spirit, though. And you know, we cannot even imagine what they what they endured. We are grateful for their resiliency because today we have over 44 million African Americans that have a connection to African slavery during the transatlantic slave trade. That meant their ancestors did all they could to survive. So that today in America, 44 million can claim that ancestry. That says a lot because slavery was brutal horrific now what made them survive what zahan saying is their spirituality they had a common bond where regardless of how bad their life was they still sought hope and that belief of reformation and change and that belief to move forward through their spirituality 
their belief in the supreme being guides connection to a source greater than themselves so what ends up happening in let's say plantations or areas in north america as different african groups came in because of their their forced enslavement they find a commonality that unites them like a family and that will be their spirituality So let's look at the practices of African con spiritual practices in the new world slave communities. Most groups had prophets, seers, and psychics. And what's interesting about this history, there is documentation of white European colonists seeking out these African prophets, seers, and psychics for advice, for readings, for messages. They may not want their preacher or their minister or their family to know, but there is evidence that these slave prophets and psychics are utilized by the white colonists. The conjurer, we'll hear this a lot before 1900s, this, this term conjurer, it means more or less what we call today a medium, somebody who can conjure the dead, speak and give messages from the other side. Sometimes they'll call them the two-headed, which means they are in both this world and the other world as a messenger. But the conjurer actually is sought after. You gotta remember in the first 300 years of the new world, it was rough, a lot of death, disease, wars. A lot of people lost a lot of things, family. And so here's the slave medium that's being utilized by not only people of her or his own grouping, but colonists, white European colonists, wanting messages from those who have passed on the other side. This is a picture in the background of what they call a circle or ring shout. It's when the drumming happens, the music happens and chanting happens, they use their feet, they use their body to make sounds and they all dance in a circle in a vibrational beat. What they're doing is raising their vibration to a being that's unseen, asking for protection and healing. For white colonists, this was scary to watch because they're, they're thrashing their bodies around, they're dancing to a beat, they're raising their vibration, and they're connecting to a power and energy. It was scary for those who did not know this practice. But if you're from Africa, this is very common in this part of a ceremony to connect to the other side. It's raising the vibration. There was assigned roles in the slave community. There was still what we call mothers or aunties. There would be the conjurer, somebody who was gifted, had sight. There was a priest or a bishop, somebody ministral that would assign, be able to assign this spiritual connection with the group. They may not be a media, but they knew enough of the spirituality to help those who were seeking. Always the healer, a medicine worker. Now the healer and medicine worker could also be the seer and the conjurer. This is a root doctor. This is a term that will be known through the slave community. It's somebody that knows plants and medicinal. Believe it or not, these slaves will be considered so important to the slave community, to plantations, but also to white colonists because doctors and medical practices were not available to the new world. So these special uh, slaves that had this knowledge usually passed down to them are going to be considered powerful in the slave community because not only do other Africans rely on them, but now the white colonists will rely on them to help heal. Especially when yellow fever, smallpox, those kind of viruses attack the community. And there's always the storyteller, the teacher, the minister, bringing out legends from the cultures left behind in Africa, stories passed down. This is oral history. For three, 400 years, African, Africans in America were not allowed to learn uh, to write or to read. So it was all oral history. 
we need to learn to document that oral history stories handed down um it's still lacking the the history of those who came from the atlantic slave trade and passed down their stories to their ancestors it's almost vanishing but there was always the storyteller that helped root the african back to where they came from or at least shared where they came from and a lot of those stories were spiritual stories connecting to the creator or stories about nature and, and creation. Now this is a, a drawing of an African ring dance. And then this is another drawing from the 1600s of the same type. And if you notice um, the lance or spear is used to make noise because the more noise and vibration and the continuous beats would raise the vibration to connect to an unseen force. So what happened when African Americans appeared? That means Africans had been in the new world long enough that they were either born in America or they assimilated to the cultures in America. Well, we see that there's an emergence or a blending of Catholicism slash Christianity. It depends on where they are. If they're in Florida, Texas, that it'll be more Catholicism. Maryland will have Catholicism. New Orleans will have Catholicism. Uh, New England will have Protestant religion. The South, of course, uh, Protestant type religions. So you'll see Catholicism and Christianity merging with African spirituality. African spirituality, um, regardless of the groups, um, you have to remember Islam was a big part of African culture, especially in the North African nations that were influenced by the Arabs. And there was a belief of allowing people on their own path. So that's how the Arabs allowed Judaism and Christianity to still live among their Islamic groups in North Africa. That same type of respect, the African spiritualists said, you know, we expect your, you know, respect your Christianity, and we just want the same respect back. And unfortunately, enslavement literally forced Christianity on a lot of them. But when they tried to merge the two, and they would conduct their services or their dances or their raising of vibration or their trans mediumship, it was rejected by white European Christians. So despite having altars and crosses and symbolisms that reflect Christianity, they were told that they couldn't dance anymore, they couldn't sing, drums were no longer allowed, healing services and trans mediumship was not allowed. And European colonists learned to fear them. They feared any non-practiced Christian ceremony, service, practice, and it led to restricting slave spirituality. So most of them had to go underground. Soon, the conjurer was in high demand, especially after the American Revolution, and later on, even with the Civil War, a lot of Africans that had the gift of sight, mediums, psychics, would be looked at, sought after by white Americans or European colonists, and they became kind of powerful among the slave community. Also, we have documentation of physical mediumship, such as moving furniture, bending objects, we have uh, documentation of African conjurers healing, especially white colonists. We also have a sense of knowledge in the African communities, in the slave communities, of these conjurers being able to protect them from harm, whether it was from the slave master or overseer or from disease. Soon the gifted slave was the most feared and respected person on the plantation, in the community, in the colony. Soon their gifts were sought after by both black and white patrons. And their help in developing the new world 
especially the idea that an unseen force can help and protect, is documented. I'm going to show you a timeline here. Spiritualism, modern or past, tends to look at social justice problems and try to resolve them, whether bring equality about, bring an end to a practice such as slavery. And in African spiritualism, it's the same. They want people to be able to be equal and free. And those who are very entranced in African spiritualism will be the leaders in the slave revolts. Now, most of these revolts I'm going to talk about are not studied in American history. A lot of them may come about after um, colonialism ends. Some of them may come about because they're from the Caribbean. The first one I want to talk about, though, is in New York. At the time, New Amsterdam, which was owned by the Dutch, was one of the largest slave ports was New York Harbor, what we call New York Harbor today. And a lot of African slaves were either there working for the Dutch or in holding cells waiting to be sold to other parts of the colony. There was a major revolt in what we now call Manhattan. And the Dutch realized that this rebellion wasn't going to end. So in 1644, they granted a piece of land to a group of Africans to become free blacks in North America. These Africans uh, ended up growing this community and became one of the first free black communities in North America. And they lived free under Dutch rule. Things will change though when New York happens and the English take over. In 1692, we've all heard of the Salem witch trials, but rarely do we look at Tituba, the African slave that was first accused of witchcraft. It is documented that she was considered practicing fortune telling or psychic and conjuring the dead. She does not die in the Salem witch trials because she's considered a slave and thus property. But the point is, she was feared. She was sought after by the, the group of Salem colonists. And she was known to practice African spirituality. In 1712, a free Akan African known as Peter the Doctor will organize one of the largest New York slave rebellions. This is against the British. And he literally creates amulets and things to protect those slaves who are rebelling and fighting for their freedom. This is the first time we see African spiritualism used with an unseen force producing an amulet or some type of object that could protect those who wore it. In 1739 in Florida, a lot of people do not know this history, but a group of Wolof Africans and a group of Seminole Indians joined together and fought the, Flor the Spaniards. They actually won their freedom, were granted their own fort, which was later known as the Negro Fort. And they will practice and live as they want to, as free Blacks. This will actually become a spot where many of the Southern plantations, such as in South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, they all try to run and find freedom in Fort Moses, Florida. Andrew Jackson will eventually invade this fort and fight them. And there will be a big battle known as the Battle of the Negro Fort. We don't study this history, but it will start the Black Seminole Wars. Why is it called Black Seminole Wars? Because it's Africans and the indigenous groups of Florida joining together to fight the Americans. A lot of the African spirituality was retained in this fort. They still practice their African roots and their spirituality, which inspired a lot of the community around there and in the state of Florida eventually. The OB conjurer known as Tacky was actually inspired by a woman who we'll talk about next, but will lead one of the largest rebellions in Jamaican history. Again, the belief that something greater than themselves 
is helping leading them and inspiring them. This whole idea of a spiritualist belief. And of course, we all have heard about the Haitian Revolution that connected um, the freedom of Africans in the Caribbean island of or Haiti. What we'll see is African spiritualism and the fear of African spiritual leaders is still prevalent at this time in 1795, especially with the French view of what African spiritualism means, almost like an unseen force is protecting them and guiding them. Now, let me go back to Jamaica for a second. Jamaica is an island that becomes one of the largest stopping ports for Africans before they're sold to the New World, to places such as New Orleans and St. Augustine and Baltimore and New York. In Jamaica, they create what they call seasoning towns. Now, a lot of times we are not known, about, we are not educated about seasoning towns, but it is the most horrific type of encampment. They force the African from their African homes in, in the continent and they force them to Jamaica where they literally beat out the, like, uh, how do I say, they force them to assimilate, to be uh, obedient. They also Christianize them and they make it impossible for them to imagine going back to Africa. It is documented over 2 million pot pass through these seasoning encampments in Jamaica. Not many that lived. One woman will rise up and she will lead a rebellion against these seasoning camps. And she will use her a con spirituality to inspire a revolt. Her name is Queen Nanny. And today she is actually a part of the money from Jamaica. You'll see her face on the $500 um, dollar bill there. Well, I guess it's not a dollar. But... She's from the Gold Coast of a con. She was known to be a trans medium a healer, but the biggest thing she was, was a military leader. She inspired Africans that went through some of these seasoning towns to still have hope, to rise up and become free. A, the gr a group that she helps free from these seasoning camps will run into the mountains and they are now labeled Maroons. They are able to keep their African culture and language. They have retained all their African practices. The um, English can't find them. They finally give up. But not before Queen Nanny loses her life in the quest for her, the freedom for her people. Now, what Queen Nanny is known for besides this beautiful revolt that inspired so many in her her island she brought about spirituality she brought about the belief of the obi and this will lead to the development of hoodoo voodoo and spiritualism she will teach her people to find connections to ancestors the belief that anybody can speak to the unseen that life was eternal and that you can change even after the grave she is accredited for uniting all maroon groups that have escaped enslavement and fled, whether they fled to the mountains or created their own towns. She is also accredited to inspire Taki, who we just talked about, and especially inspiring Haitian revolution. She fought the British from 1725 until her death in 1738. She not only inspires the islands, she inspires North American slave rebellion. So I wanna to turn to um, Gula Jack Pritchard. Some may have heard of him known as Cooter Jack. That was another name for him. He was considered a spiritualist and a conjurer, but he was from Angola. Now Angola was uh, eventually colonized by the Portuguese, but before that, 
the Angolan used to speak multiple languages because they were big on trade. So he was a Bantu speaking Angolan, but he could also speak a Con, Mandi, Gula, Haitian French, and American. He could easily translate to American Creole. So because of his broad language skills, he was able to unite a lot of the slave community. He was feared by white colonists and most enslaved people feared him too because he had this magnificent ability of second sight and talking with the dead. Some say he usually was seen talking, what looked like by himself, but he could tell you who was there, what they wore, what they were about and their messages. His second sight was very defined. He appealed to African, American, African Americans and Africans who yearn for freedom because he promised them spiritual protection from the enslavement. He also made charms. He also um, united multiple groups. He would actually lead meetings. He would plan meetings. He inspired the talk of revolt. There was one blacksmith that he really inspired, Denmark Vesey, and he helped plan the rebellion. Unfortunately, the, the rebellion was found out before it actually could be executed. And Denmark Vesey and, and Gula Jack Pritchard and 34 others were executed. And the biggest thing though is he was not executed for actually revolting. He was executed because he provoked the revolt by practicing superstition and using dark magic. That was actually in the records of why they prosecuted him. What ends up happening though, is his death will inspire others to take up insurrection and fight enslavement. Now what's a side note is Denmark Vesey is one of the founders of the American Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church in South Carolina. But yet he's very much tied to this spiritualist conjurer who talked to the dead, who healed, who practiced what this group called magic, but healing ceremonies. And um, he goes down in history as being one of the leaders of a re revolution or a rebellion. Most American children are taught the Nat Turner story. Now, originally, the Nat Turner story was taught because it showed a failed rebellion and an execution. It was almost like, don't do this or this will happen kind of history. But actually, Nat Turner is very influential, not, in, not only with the slave community, but in the view of African Americans and spiritualism. So let me explain. First, we need to know a little bit of Nat Turner's history. His mother was an African, right from the shores of Africa. And since his birth, he was always told by his mother that he had the gift of prophecy. He will be raised by his mother and his father's mother, Lydia, but his own father, Abram, Abraham, will run away and never get caught or recaptured. So around seven years old, Nat Turner loses his father, but it's considered a good reason because the man reached freedom and safety. In the 1820s, Nat Turner will have a series of visions in which a voice will tell him to prepare for a great battle. He believed the voice was God. He became a prophet and a medium, and he gathered followers among the enslaved by the thousand. In 1831, though, a series of natural phenomenons occurred, including a solar eclipse. And Nat believed he received a sign from God to act on this belief to do battle. In that moment, he and his group will attack 11 plantations and kill over 55 people. He was eventually caught and executed on November 11th, 1831. Now, how does this pertain to African spiritualism? It cemented a fear of anybody who practiced mediumship or prophecy that had dark skin. It literally created a negative stereotype against a colored spiritualist. The actions of Nat Turner inspired his people, but to those who enslaved them, 
it was a message that they should not allow African spirituality to exist or somebody to claim that they can talk to the dead or somebody that can claim that they hear voices or that they can heal or they have a message from God. So it causes a restriction in laws and it forces anybody that is of color that has these gifts to go underground. And it also puts a fear of anybody of color that has these gifts by the other people in society, such as white Americans. Now, what do you do if you want to live with yourself and not enslave people, but yet you fear African Americans? Well, for some of the spiritualist groups and some of the abolitionist groups, they look at sending Africans and African Americans back to where it all began, which was Africa. But it backfires. So let's talk about this. The U.S. Congress will fund multiple expeditions to return formerly enslaved African people back to the west coast of Africa from the years of 1816 to 1862. The American Colonization Society had a plan. But their plan failed, and it failed due to their ignorance of tribal differences in, in the continent of Africa, the differences in religion and languages. By the time they will start sending Africans and African Americans back, most of them were already assimilated into American culture, American society. So assimilation had already occurred, and so some of these people were African by birth, but American in thought, or some of the groups were African American, never to have ever known their African roots. So they get shipped over and dropped off in, let's say, Sierra Leone or Liberia. And they're among people that are not Christian, that they're not, you know, dressed similar or culturally similar. Now, the picture I have down here is actually a picture taken from Sierra Leone. And what is interesting, in the background, you see some groups dressed in modern day clothes and some dressed in traditional garb. So what ends up happening is a lot of those African Americans will return back to the U.S. This is before slavery ended. And they will bring back with them some of the influences they've gotten or they received or they were experienced in Africa, which then cements again African spiritual beliefs. It merges them or infuses them with Christian religion. So now we see a, a resurgence of hoodoo, voodoo, and spiritualism. I do want to put out there, though, that some of the key African-American abolitionists at the time, such as Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, William Lloyd Garrison, are against the Return to Africa movement because these are African-Americans born in America. They should have the right to their equality and freedom in the land they were born in. Okay, do we want to take a break yet or? <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. I had to find my microphone. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and take like a seven minute paw bathroom break. Okay. Uh, do you fill your cup? Stretch your legs. Inhale, exhale. Um, <laughs> it's <break>. a lot because <laughs> it, it is a lot, and it's it's. Um, what I would suggest, though, is that those who might have questions that they want to talk about, go ahead and start typing them into the chat. Um, hold on. I'm going to change the chat feature because for some reason, I'm the only I, actually we're going to leave it that way. You can start typing them in the chat. That way I can start um, getting a list of them and making sure that we get to everything you guys will have later on. All right, seven minutes from now, I'm all talking through your breaks. Uh, so we'll be we'll reconvene at about eleven oh three. Do you want me to stop sharing, or am I good? Oh, you're good. We can stop. We could just hold it here, and I'm going to hit you... pause on the recording. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, our break. We will going now resume with okay. Rebecca Cox Jackson. 
Okay, so what I want to do in this next section is highlight some known spiritualists or people that were involved in the spiritualist, modern American spiritualist religion in the time where there was still slavery, okay? And I want to highlight that that African spiritualism existed with them prior to them being connected to, let's say, Amy Post or... Um, Corinna Scott or any of those groups. So I want to just showcase some key African Americans and their connection with spiritualism. So we're going to start with Rebecca Cox Jackson. Now let's let's talk a little bit about her history. Um, she was born free in Ohio. Um, she will lose her parents, both of her parents, by the age of 13, and she had siblings. She had older siblings and younger siblings. Um, she will be sent to live with her older brother, who is an AME, American or African Methodist Episcopal pastor. And he will have her live with them, but her goal is to raise not only her siblings, but help with his kids. Um, she would later marry, um, but never have kids of her own. Starting around the 1830s, now remember, she is in a religious home where her brother is a pastor and very devoted to his church. So religion is all around her being. But she will start having visions to heal people in very different ways than are taught by the AME group. And she is told to start living a more spiritual life. More or less, spirit is driving her to remove herself from any religion and just follow spirit. So this will, um, this will encourage her to leave her marriage and her family in Ohio. And she will literally move east where she becomes known as a healer and a medium, a trans medium too. And literally by 1840, she's drawing thousands of people of all races to her tents. She'll set up a tent and do healing and mediumship work. Now, it is documented that from around 1845 to roughly around 1858, again, this is all during slave time, okay? Slavery will not end on record till 1865, and technically, we see evidence of it still continuing until almost 1869, but this is during slave time that she is in Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, we have a large spiritualist church. And we, of course, we have the Quakers and the Shakers and all these other groups around there. And she starts showcasing her trans mediumship and healing. At the same time, she's very active in the abolitionist movement. And her goal is to help ex-slave women that are coming up from the South to kind of find some permanency in, in a home outside of slavery. She eventually leaves the spiritualist movement to start her own commune up in New York. Um, the Shaker movement will fund it, and she'll be known as a Mother Rebecca Cox Jackson. Um, her community practiced the Shaker ideology, but she infused it with African spiritualism that consists of mediumship, healing, and prophecy. So she still retains her African spiritualist roots while merging or infusing it with modern day religion. Now, we have to talk about Harriet Tubman because it has been reported that she had dreams and foretold her own flight from bondage and that she was known to have visions and hear voices. Now, again, if you are raised with the idea of a conjurer, and you are familiar with a con spirituality or any type of tribal or you know, African spiritualism, then anybody who talks about people that have died or talks about hearing voices or gets premonitions, they're esteemed and revered and respected. So this very small statue of a woman literally becomes the leader of the slave rebellion in the South. She starts using her visions and her voices. She starts listening and using her intuition to guide hundreds of people to safety and to freedom all the way up to Canada. She becomes the leader of what we now call the Underground Railroad. Now, why would a, ru a runaway slave who's risking their life trust this small stature of a woman? It's because of her prophecy. 
they believed in her abilities to connect to an unseen force. If they had not had that African spiritualist upbringing or that, that influence, would they have trusted to just go with this woman in the middle of the night? No, they had to somehow be trained or influenced to trust her because she had this ability to connect with an unseen force. We do know that Harriet Tubman does connect with Amy and Isaac Post, who are considered, you know, leaders in the modern American spiritualist movement. We do know that she bought a house not far from them in New York and lived there. We do know she was exposed to modern spiritualism in her lifetime. Now, this is what's interesting. By the Civil War, the U.S. Army will trust, the Union Army will trust this woman and her voices and her gut instinct and her intuition, but they also trust her ability to gather intel. They didn't care how she got it, but they trusted it. And she actually will earn the unofficial rank of a colonel and command her own regiment. This is kind of unheard of because women at this time didn't even have the right to vote, let alone here is this woman in combat and she's black, which defies all odds. Is it because they relied on her spiritual abilities, her ability to conjure, or was it that they didn't care how she got it as long as they saw results? We don't know, but they did trust her. Sojourner Truth. As a, as a slave, she was surrounded by African and American spiritualism. Once free in 1826, she does become a Christian, heavily influenced by the Quakers and the Methodists. But she also still retains her African spiritualism because she believes in the power of the unseen force. 1843, she has a vision. And she believes God is telling her to become the spokesperson for the abolitionist movement. She risks everything to stand in front of a group of white Americans telling them that slavery is wrong. By 1856, she turned to spiritualism, works with the spiritualists such as Amy Post, and actually moves to a spiritualist utop utopian community in Michigan, where she stays from 1857 to 1867. Some believe it's because of the tornadic weather, a tornado ripped through the uh, spiritualist community and left everything in shambles. That's why a lot of people never returned and why it didn't succeed. We don't know the reason why Sojourner Truth left. But we do know she was there for 10 years living as a spiritualist and practicing mediumship and healing. Um, some say she lived as a Christian spiritualist. Others say she lived as a Quaker. Others prophesize, you know, that or off, others wrote about how she prophesized and held trans mediumship sessions and seances. By all recollection she she lived as a spiritualist because she did practice all the key things that we now as spiritualists do um, practice ourselves so now this is a new one many people do not know about she is known as la madama she is caroline Dye, and she's from arkansas she was born in 1810 and lived till 1918 the paintings that I talked about in the very se the second slide actually are of her. She was the model for the paintings that we see here on the side. She was known as a spiritualist and a root doctor. So she knew, she knew about herbs, plants, healing. She was a gifted clairvoyant and healer. There's tons, I mean, I don't want to say tons, that's, that's a too vague. There is at least 20 to 30 um, memoirs or diary uh, logins of people saying that they knew of her or they had seen her work or that they had visited her. One of them is Rosalind's own daughter who is in some of these paintings. And she writes about how... He, uh, Caroline gave her messages and prophesied and did healing for her. So it is documented that she was clairvoyant and a healer. Some people in the area of Arkansas didn't know her as 
Caroline, they knew her as the two-headed woman, a conjurer with power to see into two worlds, usually the past and the future or the realm of the living and the dead. Again, Harry Rosalind painted over 35 pictures of her working as a medium, healer, reader, and fortune teller. And this is all documented in his paintings. A musician actually wrote a blues song about her called the Aunt Carolyn Dyer Blues. It was written by Willie, Willie Shade, Will Shade in the Memphis Jug Band. Unfortunately, after her death in 1918, by the 1930s, a hoodoo woman took her name and started practicing hoodoo under her. So people want to file her history under hoodoo, not spiritualism. But the original Carolyn Dyer that lived from 1810 to 1918 should be considered a spiritualist because she followed the spiritualist doctrine that was taught in the South. So who would she have kind of intermingled with in the South to know about spiritualism? This is where we talk about Henri Louis Ray. He he was a New Orleans abolitionist, but his family was from Haiti, literally came over to live in New Orleans, Louisiana area after the Haitian Revolution. He will turn to spiritualism after his father's death, and also because he was fed up with the Catholic Church publicly endorsing slavery in New Orleans at this time. In 1850, he brought spiritualism to Louisiana. Some say he studied up in St. Louis. Some people said he went all the way to New York. We have no idea where he learned spiritualism as far as our modern American spiritualism, but he does bring it to New Orleans. He will hold seances, circles, and services in French, but he opens it to all races. In 1862, he becomes a captain in the Louisiana Native Guard, which was the first Black regiment of the Union Army and he will fight with this unit at Port Hudson. After the war, he became a well-known medium, was said to have received messages from Jesus, President Lincoln, Napoleon, Louverture, and Voltaire. But the biggest thing he's known for is his activism. He literally will try to do changes in laws and help fight for African-American rights. So some people believe the groups that were inspired in the South are coming out of New Orleans. So what is the impact of African spiritualism in America? Well, African spiritualism, as we talked about, believes in an infinite inventor. That's what they called it um, in the Akan spiritualism. It was a being that was connected to all creation, all nature. They believed in universal natural laws, they believed that music, dance, and the idea of raising one's vibration physically could connect them to an unseen spiritual force. They believed in healing techniques and medicine that could inspire science and support views of spiritual healing. They believed in connecting to a spiritual realm in order to do the healing. They believed in the continua continuation of life after death and the communication of those who have gone before us. They believed in the Reformation and that life can continue to change, grow, even after death. They believed in prophecy and phenomena. It wasn't unheard of to see physical mediumship in African spiritualism in America. They also believed that we have it in our mind, in our consciousness, to create our happiness or unhappiness. I mean, we talked about slavery being some of the most horrific times in African Americans' ancestry. But to be told that you can still be happy, it's a thought process. So they taught the slave to seek happiness through spiritual means when everything else didn't seem like it was capable of happiness. Again, African spiritualism not only encouraged African Americans to continue living and to, to grow, but it also influenced white colonists and later white Americans, and it influenced religion. Now, in the 1940s, there was a debate. Does African spiritualism affect modern Black spiritualist movement? There is a movement in the 1920s that literally breaks in the spiritualist community. 
because of segregation laws. What ends up happening is African-American mediums, healers, prophets are forbidden to practice in a white church. So if most spiritualist churches are integrated, it was considered illegal, especially below the Mason-Dixon border. And so to keep African-American spiritualists safe, some of the spiritualist groups decided to segregate even their groupings, which goes against a lot of what spiritualism stands for, right? But the rest of society was so violent towards the integration that it was almost like their hands were tied. And that's a whole different class, right? But the point is, there was a division and a segregation in spiritualism that started around 1926, where instead of a national spiritualist association of churches, now is a national spiritualist of colored churches, okay? So they literally force African-Americans to create their own spiritualist movement. And in doing so, it also allows them to go back to their African spiritualist roots because now they can practice spiritualism the way it's been handed down, which may include raising vibrations through doing a root circle dance or using drums to raise their vibration or practicing healing methods that are more in line with their African spiritualist upbringing. But let's talk about this debate. So we have an anthropologist, and we have a sociologist debating the matter of African culture and its survival in modern Black American culture. Now, remember, this is the 1940s. We are in the middle, just either ended a war or just, you know, are in the middle of World War II. And we have Herxovitz, who's the anthropologist, debating Frazier, who's the sociologist. Herxovitz argues that Black Modern Black culture exhibits great numbers of African traits, especially in spirituality. He said there's no doubt that African Americans in the 1940s were influenced and still influenced because they're still practicing African spirituality. Frazier argues that no, it was destroyed. All African culture was totally destroyed once slavery happened. And that unlike South America and the Caribbean, Blacks in North America did not retain their African roots. So this debate literally goes on in academic circles. There's journal entries, articles. There's even an actual physical debate between the two. But by 1960, when Black is Beautiful movement, the civil rights movement, and of course, African-American cultural history is taught, Herkovitz's position gains credibility, and he becomes known as the father of New World African Studies. And he will be supported in the 1940s by Du Bois and Woodson and Puckett. But the biggest thing is he pushes people to seek out African spiritualism and African culture, even in their own families, in their own communities, and to give them that connection to African spirituality. So what are the influence of African spiritualism? First off, we know that African slavery had been around for over 300 years by the time 1848 and the Fox sisters' wrappings and Davis's writings. So for 300 years, 12 million people, there has to be an impact or influence on society, religion, culture, and history. Influences and reliances on healers and conjurers of the African population were written about, documented, and known, especially in the southern states. When yellow fever struck the south, they turned to conjurers and African healers to help heal their, their people, their communities. When a need for a doctor, a need a connection for grieving to heal from some death or some impact of death, they, they turned to the African slave that was known as a conjurer. This has been documented. The impact of beliefs influenced various versions of spiritualism. Now, if we look at other religions, such as hoodoo, voodoo in the Caribbean, or even universalism, we see a lot of African spiritualism in their beliefs too. 
and it's kind of connected. It's just how is it performed? How is it uh, brought in? How is how are they connecting to this unseen force? But there is definitely an impact to African spiritualism in each of those. Also, we see some variations of Christian religions, such as the AME and the Pentecostal religions during the Second Great Awakening in the, in the 1800s that are influenced by African spiritualism and slavery. Segregation in the 20th century made this history concerning influences of African spiritualism unknown in most sectors of American life and culture. It was almost swept under the rug. Let's not talk about that because we're not even allowed to integrate with them and we're not even allowed to work with them as mediums and healers. And so instead of embracing people of color in spiritualism, we almost segregate them ourselves and isolate them which then creates a division and it creates African-Americans to create their own spiritualist beliefs in churches and customs and associations. Now, again, I want to definitely say that this presentation was created to present this history, but also to reclaim the historical influences and impact of African econ spiritualism on American and modern American spiritualism. This is my findings. This is my perspective on this. And that's what I'm presenting to you. Okay, so that is everything. Whew. Thank you for attending this presentation. I am open for questions or I, I think I might need to stop sharing so I can see the chat room. Um, please, again, if you are interested in my bibliography, please contact Charvone for a copy and she can send it to you. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Sounds good. Okay. All right. That was deep. That was, there was a lot that was fascinating. That was educational. Um, and now I'm turning it over to questions. Um, since we, it's Sue and Rosemary. Hi, you guys don't need to type in the chat. You can just unmute yourself if you have any questions, comments, et cetera. I can't hear you, Rosemary, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, we can't hear you. Can I unmute you this way? Let me see if I can unmute you. Ask to unmute now. Let's see. There, can you? Can't, we can't hear you. <laughs> Is your headphones you. plugged in or unplugged? Welcome to Techno. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I, have, I have a question. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Rosemary, um, we'll get back to you. <laughs> I, I, I would really love the opportunity. And I know that we can um, invite people to m make a donation and um, see this video. Thank you for that. But I, I wondered if we could if there's a way that we could show it, for instance, to our whole church and then have a, a discussion around it. Yes. Um, yes. I'm not even going to. All right. Uh, I uh, want uh, it out there. So uh, uh, I, I am passionate about that. If, what, if you would like, maybe the church collects a donation. Like, in other words, I can um, allow it for it to be shared. I mean, if with Angela's permission, of course. Oh. I can allow it to be shared with your church. Um, I would like to see some sort of donation sure. uh, made for the, the headstone because this is why this was Angela graciously gave up even her portion so that she could donate it. And I believe this work is so intense. She put a lot of time, effort, and energy into it. Um, and I want compensation, but I want it to be for the right reasons. But no, I am not against um, it being shared with your church at all, because I, I believe this information needs to get out there. And I think Angela's done a beautiful job presenting it. And, and if you want, Sue, to invite me um, to be there just to answer questions after the video share, I, I will do that for you. That I would love that, because, again, I did all... I, my whole goal with that was to show that there is a connection with people of color to modern American spiritualism. And even though in the 1920s, there was that division, 
by acknowledging them today, hopefully we can unite again and, mm -hmm. and merge the two spiritualisms together again, like it was for hundreds of years. You know what I mean? It's just that idea of the division happened because of segregation, okay. not because the spiritualist group truly wanted that to happen. It was, to, you know, everything I've read was we want to keep them safe and it's dangerous for them to be in our church because we're white and they're black and segregation laws forbid it. So um, a, a, a different question. Um, it occurred to me as you were going through it that the, this um, influence of, of African spiritualism, it, the, the reverse of that is also perhaps part of why the Christian church does not embrace mediumship and you know all, all the pieces of spiritualism well most indigenous groups whether they're from africa or north america or you know wherever have that belief in connecting to an unseen force whether we call it mediumship or prophecy or what, whatever it is is that belief that there is the ability of us in physical form being able to connect to some world out of this world energy and it's been around thousands of years. I mean, there's documentation in the Celtic religions and, and whatnot. And it doesn't fit into Christianity. That's just a given because Christianity is, you know, focused on a certain aspect of it. And if too many people had that ability, I think it would question a lot of the dogma and ideology. So by controlling it in North America, they deny groups such as the African, such as the indig indigenous groups, um, the Hispanic Latino groups. And that kept a division just because of that. It's not Christian, the non-Christian groups. Um, and I do agree with you that it does transcend to spiritualism too. And yet we have Christian spiritualists. I mean, I, we talked about yeah. Sojourner Truth, right? The beauty of African spiritualism, modern American spiritualism, indigenous spiritualism is they believe you have your own path. So if you want to still be Christian, but also believe in the ability of mediumship and healing and prophecy and trans mediumship and physical mediumship, you can still do that. And that's where we get the Christian spiritualism. But at the same time, if you want to be Buddhist or if you want to whatever. So I, I, I would rather be spiritualist and allow people to be on their own path. And if I want to celebrate Christmas, because that's, you know, where I feel more comfortable, then fine. Or if I want to drum and listen to drumming while I tune in or attune myself energetically, then that's my spiritualism. But I think modern American spiritualism is a combination. And when we deny one group that ability to combine their culture and their way of energy, then we deny being American because American is a combination of cultures infused together in, in customs. So I don't know if that makes sense, Sue. I, I don't know. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, Rosemary, um, can quick, you hear you? Yeah, Sorry, Rosemary, you. Yeah, I was just going to bring so, back to Rosemary. Can you yes. hear me? Yay! I don't know. <laughs> Technology has not been kind this week. Well, first, I just want to say thank you, Angela. It was a beautiful overview of, of a very complex history, right? And, um, and it, just makes, it just makes so much sense as a missing, missing piece, missing perspective, because you know, what does spiritualism teach us? But we don't live in isolation, but our history acts like we do. Or 1848, poof, everything happened. And there's just the briefest mentions of the political movements of that year, right? Besides everything that, that went before us. So um, I'm just, I'm really grateful to you and um, look forward to more people understanding that we have such a rich history and a rich partnership um, and how can we um, stand in, in um, healthier allyship with uh, more, um, more of our partners? Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, a point I wanted before you, I'm sorry. So a okay. point I wanted to address about the separate, the segregation or the separation of spiritualism is you also have to remember 
because there was a separation and segregation back in 1848 with the Native American, with the abolitionist movement. Spiritualists is the one group that if we were to embrace all of our history, we would be able to prove that there is no way we could ever be a cult. <laughs> ever. My right. current favorite topic. <laughs> My current favorite topic is cults. But that this, as, as a religion, we, we all did, don't agree. We all don't, as you were refer, referring back to earlier, what you were saying about different paths, our own individual journey and in our spiritual, spiritualism allows that individual journey to be our own journey. Right. And that what we're really doing is communing and communing and coming together as a community but we're not trying to force dogma and creed on each other. Like we all have to believe this way or it can't work. Right. Um, when we deny that, that rich part of our history, we are going, in my personal opinion, going against our, who we are mm -hmm. as modern American spiritualists. So the, the other thing that came to my mind was the power in saying I'm not a Christian when someone asks you about spiritualism or are you celebrating Easter assuming you know or what are you doing for Easter in the same way and you know I don't look Muslim I don't look Jewish to many people and when I've noticed when I say I'm not Christian it throws them because there's this belief that everybody is which got infused even in more so earlier on in spiritualism, but the Christian um, spiritualism, which I, I personally don't understand. But <laughs> I, can throw, I can throw some wrenches and people get so shocked, but like even Thomas Jefferson wasn't considered a Christian. He did not consider himself a Christian. Yeah. And yet he's considered the father of our Declaration of Independence, right? And the whole, um, whole American democracy, but even he had yeah. issues with Christianity. Mm -hmm. The yeah. problem I think is it wasn't so much that they were afraid of us being non-Christian or whatever. It was the, they were afraid of our activism. And mm -hmm. so a lot of that fear-based stereotypes of spiritualism, whether it was our modern American spiritualism or African spiritualism or whatever type of spiritualism was the power it had over changing minds and hearts. And if you're trying to keep people enslaved, mm -hmm. the last thing you want, is somebody from the dead telling you about the afterlife and saying, you better change your ways. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so they put a fear based out there against it, but I don't think it was driven because of spirituality. I think it was more driven by political, social concerns. Mm -hmm. And that's something why I think I'm proud to be a spiritualist is because we do have that activism history mm -hmm. and that some of us in our past, like Sojourner Truth and Amy Post and what those groups risk their whole lives, you know, and, you know, Angela Grimke is a perfect example of that. I mean, she left everything in this pursuit of standing up for the right for equality for African-Americans, women, Native Americans. And that's, what's beautiful about it. Cause they were spirit led. They trusted mm -hmm. spirit so much that they were not afraid to speak out against the ills of society at that time. I would love to do a research of modern times from 1900s to our present day to see who also was a spiritualist that spoke out like during the civil rights movement, the, you know, during all that 1960s, 70s time period and 50s time period. I would love to see during the LBGTQ, you know, activism, who was a spiritualist then? Because I have, you know, history of that in the 1800s. I mean, Rebecca Cox Jackson mm -hmm. was and very proudly married a female partner. And that was, you know, during a time where women still didn't have the right to vote. And she, here she is a black woman during slave time living very proudly as a, you know, an LBGTQ person. So again, there's so much activism and spiritualism and it's so connected to having the ability to spread equality and the ability for people to be free and whether it's their religious beliefs or their race or whatever. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. I hope I can do more of these lectures or these lyceums or what do you want to call them? <laughs> All right. 
are there any other comments, questions, et cetera? Et cetera, et cetera. Just, and the one just, thing, if you wanted to, oh, I'm sorry, Rosemary, go ahead. There's just so many implications. It's just um, everything you said and more um, to really fully understand the moment we're in now and the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in addition, if you wanted to look into the spiritualist movement, is I would look, I would look at the the influx of the new age movement in the 60s and the 70s and look at that that talking point and was that is are by us excluding the hippies the hippies from the spiritualist experience are we excluding spiritualists because as you had spoken to earlier about the african spiritualism and being called conjurers as a way to, de to demean and degrade are we calling them hippies because we don't want to give legitimacy to that movement and its effect upon the vietnam war its effect upon the civil rights movement etc so mm -hmm. that's definitely something to look into because yeah, it's as as you're saying that what i'm thinking is and that was the that was a group who was also doing healing differently going back to more traditional methods um, and looking at herbal things again. And so a lot of things that were circling back around came back out of, out of that movement. I will actually talk about that in another Lyceum, which is tomorrow on indigenous, because what ends up happening, why the hippie movement is controversial is because it's usually um, white uh, Americans that cultural appropriate because at the time it was illegal for indigenous people to, and people, some people of color to practice spirituality. Um, Native Americans didn't get their religious rights till 1978. And so if they can't go to the reservation and find their guru, they're going to write it themselves by reading, you know, 1800, 1600, 1700s uh, history uh, written by Jesuit priests who observe ceremonies and then trying, oh, I'm going to recreate the sun dance or I'm going to recreate healing ceremonies. And so they more or less, I don't want to say steal, but that's kind of what it's viewed as. And they steal this cultural practice and then market it and make a profit, never giving credit to the indigenous group but that's a whole different topic <laughs> so but not but necessarily a different topic because if you think about african american african spiritualism and the advent of modern american spiritualism is that there's some form of stealing there's there's some oh, yeah. form of appropriation and turning it into a profit right because the conjurers and healers african mm -hmm. healers of the time were not being paid for their services but mm -hmm. they were being marketed and sold by their plantation owners yep. to different plantations and they were making money off of them. Right, right. And then as we come into the turn of the century, we now have medicine, you know, that you read the advertisement by this oil or by this bottle and you're going to receive. So mm -hmm. then that's where the money part of it comes into it. But it's mostly done by white Europeans or white Americans at that time. Right. Right. It's, yeah, it, white, I mean, it, it's, a, mostly. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, the whole idea too is spiritualism. I mean, when we limit con uh, connection, mm -hmm. you know, we say, oh, that can't be possible. You know, it, it actually demeans spiritualism. So there has to be a way where, because spirit is, you know, connected to a higher source. So they wouldn't disrespect at least I wouldn't think. So we need to look at, too, the context in which some of the information is coming through, especially in the 1800s. Um, and that's one of the things I, I like to focus on is I'm not saying I'm Houdini by any means, but I'm not a skeptic either, but I am an investigator. So I want to see, is this person truly getting, you know, it's, Rosemary, you taught me that. It's like, is, is, are you truly aligned with spirit or is this some of your own bias coming through or is this somehow your own connection coming through? And, and how do you tell the difference? And I was, we weren't at those seances in the 1800s. We don't know what was truly coming through because we weren't there. But reading some of the transcripts, you kind of question, 
You know, do we know the history of Andrew Jackson Davis? Do we know the history of posts? Do we know where they truly stand in their views of people of color? And where are, you know, how are they acting in spiritualism? So that, that has to be investigated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has been. I mean, I'm, this is 2021. I'm not the first historian to look at this. In the 1890s, there was tons of them opening up because we were trying to establish a religion and we had to justify that because we weren't allowed to be a philosophy we had to become a religion in order for people not to get arrested for fortune telling or witchcraft so when we look at that it's a whole another part of spiritualism that kind of needs to be investigated and researched more agreed agreed well i i am totally grateful i am also hopeful that this is the last of our um talks our lyceums through this um and that also segues into the church of peace and spiritualist centers upcoming events and what's going on as you all know we we meet every tuesday night as a church service and then next month um i will be teaching on december 11th i believe that's the date don't quote me on it but it will go out newsletter with the correct times and dates are um how to be a culturally sensitive media which ties into where is it coming from? Is it coming from your personal bias itself? Um, or is this is actually something that you're being brought through from spirit? So if you're interested in that class, um, I will be putting that out in our next newsletter. If you're on our email list, if not, I will be posted on our Facebook page. Again, I am so thankful and gracious to Angela for her time, her effort, her energy, her and sharing her knowledge and her talent with us all. I feel touched and blessed to know you. Thank you. And so with much. that, that concludes Thank you so um, much. this Lyceum. And I'm going to stop recording.